Hello, and welcome back to Maya's Reviews, a book, podcast, and blog. If you're new here, welcome, and I hope you stick around. I promise I'll at least try to make it worth your time. (laughs) Before I get started on the episode and my review today, I wanted to talk about my schedule for both the podcast and the blog really quick. I usually review at least one book a week on my blog and post the reviews on Wednesdays. For the podcast, I'm planning on doing the same thing, but posting the episodes on Fridays. I mean, that could change in the future. I'll let you know if it does. As of right now, expect a review on the blog on Wednesdays and a review on the podcast on Fridays. If I don't post an episode on a Friday, I will try to let you know. I'll most likely put an update under the podcast page underneath updates. So if I don't post on Friday and you're sitting there wondering where an episode is, check there because either I've completely forgotten, which probably not going to happen, or something has gone awry and I need time to post an episode. So that's all I have for news for today. For my review, I will be talking about the first book in the Twin Paradox series, The Twin Paradox, by Charles Wachter. A quick note before the episode begins, I consistently call Paul Pauls throughout this episode, so... I just wanted to formally apologize for that before the episode began, so have fun. This is one of my more recent reviews, and there is a bit of a trigger warning, so if if you want to read this book, death, torture, and violence are all in the novel, so if you don't want to read about those, I would not recommend you to read this book. I want to send a thank you to Neck Alley and Trevani Bay for providing me with an arc of this book in exchange for an honest review. I rated the novel 5 out of 5 stars. It was literally such an amazing book. I loved it so much. It's, I think I even, I put it on my favorite bookshelf on Goodreads. So I absolutely love this novel and I cannot tell you how impatient I am for the sequel to come out because I think it's next year, I'm not sure. (laughs) I think it's next year that the next novel comes out. I rated the plot five out of five stars, literally everything. The setting, characters, writing, memorability, plot, everything was five out of five stars. This is literally an amazing book. And like I said, one of my favorites. It's a really timeless tale and a future classic. It's so original. It's a fascinating story. It's full of adventure, science, theories, friendship, danger, and survival, and it reminds me a lot of Jurassic Park. It was so unique and so vibrant. It was amazing. Like I said earlier, The Twin Paradox was published by Trevani Bay. It's 384 pages, and it was released August 23rd, 2020. It's the first novel in the Twin Paradox series, and its sequel, Divine Paradox, is set to be published on January 31st, 2022, which it seems too far away, but whatever. One of the quotes from the novel that really just sums everything up is, I believe one of the characters, her name is Milk, says this, we are not built for this time period. This is a disaster. We should not exist. We died. Our DNA is outside its time period. So take from that what you will. There's a lot of different discoveries in this novel in terms of character self-discovery, also scientific discovery. Like I said, it reminds me a lot of Jurassic Park in the way that it's not entirely impossible. If someone really cracked how to travel back in time and create DNA copies of people, who's to say this couldn't happen? I really hope not, because that's terrifying, but... And the book description, 
With 10 years passing for every three minutes on a remote stretch of Texas coast, planes fall out of the sky, evolved species are on the hunt, and people die inside one of the most vicious ecosystems ever grown, all the result of the government's efforts to slow down time. A lot can happen in 10 years. That's the point. Governments are always racing for supremacy, for scientific breakthroughs, for technological advantages, and these things take time. Until something goes wrong, of course. With the grounded yet massive world building of Ready Player One, thrilling scientific questions of Jurassic Park, and the time-bending team drama of Before I Fall, Walker's The Twin Paradox is a brilliantly plotted tale that is both intimate and massive, relentless yet deliberate, and explores the themes of self-acceptance, self-confidence, and natural selection in a richly hued and unforgettable world. Ultimately, the eternal question of nature versus nurture is boiled down into this fast-paced thriller told over the course of five days and culminates in one single question. Do we get to choose who we are? So, obviously, it sounds really good, (laughs) which is why I read it. And, like I mentioned, it's such a mixture of different stories and worlds, but it's unique in its own way. This story has a huge cast of characters. I mean, not Western game huge, but pretty large. Among them are Alistair, Leo, Milk, Catherine, Zach, Isaac, Jimmy, Paul, and Rawls. So Alistair, Leo, and Milk have been best friends since they met at their school for super smart kids. And when I say super smart kids, I mean super smart kids. They're, they are literally biological copies of history's greatest individuals. So, Alistair is a copy of Albert Einstein, Leo of Leonardo da Vinci, Milk of Martin Luther King Jr., and Zach and Isaac are both copies of Isaac Newton. Jimmy is an ex-diver for an oil rig. Pauls is someone from the Pentagon, I guess an agent. <laughs> and Rawls is the manager of Cornerstone, the top secret project that literally consumes anyone it involves. So that's great. That's amazing. Alistair is kind of the main character of the novel, at least of the kids. The story switches between perspectives quite a lot. I mean, you have chapters where it's Alistair talking, and then it's Leo talking, and then it's Milk talking, and sometimes it's Isaac talking, sometimes it's Jimmy, sometimes it's Paul's. I don't think Rawls ever has his own little section, but it switches between point of views a lot, which is nice because personally I like when a story kind of lets you get inside multiple people's head rather than just one person, so that's always nice for me at least. Alistair, Leo, Milk, Kat, or Catherine, Zach, and Isaac, they were very interesting, and I spent a lot of time analyzing their characters. I mean, it was really fun to try and figure out, oh, what's the similarities between them and the historical figure that they're a biological copy of. They're pretty normal kids, and they act like it. You know, they're, they're immature teenagers, so... But then, on the other hand, they're very similar to the historical figures that they're replicas of, which is why the twin paradox begs the question, are we born the way we are, or do we evolve into ourselves? And it handles this question beautifully and shows that our environment truly does have an effect on us. So, Milk, oh, I loved her so much. She was by far my favorite character. She's intelligent, humane, and beautiful. So, throughout the novel, she is constantly calling Rawls out for his inhumane and possibly illegal experiments. Uh, You know, you have this circular area that's bordered by the ocean and Texas, I believe, is where the story takes place. And you have this ecosystem that has evolved millions of years into the future. And you're sending people out there, sometimes people get trapped in it, and you don't take the time to find where they are. You don't try and figure out a way to stop the time travel, essentially, mid-experiment. And people die in there, you know? You're in there, for you on the outside, it might be three minutes, but for someone in there, it's ten years. You have someone in there for an hour, they're probably not going to make it out, especially, you know, if they're not 
a newborn child, so Rawls, I definitely hated. There's so many problems with what he does, which I loved how the other characters called him out on it, because too often I feel like the jerk of the series isn't called out, which you just kind of want to see them get what they deserve. So Rawls, he raises, like I said, he runs possibly inhumane and illegal experiments. He raises a class of kids as an experiment just to see if I provide them with materials, are they going to be as good as their biological copies or are they going to be worse or better? You know, what's going to happen here? And I don't know. I feel like that's such a violation of someone's self-identity to be able to do that because they grew up thinking, you know, they're just a regular kid and then all of a sudden they graduate and they're, and they discover that they're really biological copies of these great scientists and activists and, you know, all these people and that's so just awful. And then besides that, just Cornerstone, that big experiment that I mentioned, just that to be able to accelerate time in an enclosed area and allow that area to be evolved far past everywhere else, causing issues all around you with plane crashes, glowing turtles and sharks that potentially sink an oil rig. You know, it's, I don't think that's the best thing you could do. It's probably not the worst, but it's definitely not the best. He pretty much takes no responsibility for any of the issues he causes, which is not a good thing to do, <laughs> especially when, you know, you're killing people with your experiment or ruining their lives by telling them that they're a biological copy of Albert Einstein and then that kid doesn't feel that they're living up to that person's legacy. I don't, I, I really didn't like him, so... One of the quotes from the novel, I think Milk says this as well. She's very wise for a teenage kid. Uh, she says, There is nothing special about us. There are no rules that keep us alive. Everyone dies. But because we are the center of our own story, we feel special. Like we will buck the odds. But we're not and won't. I believe that is her telling Alistair in this enclosure, we are not immortal. We can't just survive forever. That's not how this works. It may feel like it, but we are not who we think we are. And it's just really sad to me that someone can grow up their whole lives and then uh, this person, this random dude who you never met in your entire life comes up to you and is like, hey, have fun living up to this. So, <laughs> Interested in starting a podcast? I bet you haven't heard of Anchor, an app and site that makes it super easy to create your own. Not only is it free, but Anchor also allows you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor distributes your podcast for you to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more platforms. Anchor has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. It's everything you need all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M to get started today. And in terms of the writing and setting, it was a little too sciencey for my taste, but it was super visual and creative. I mean, it's not, this isn't actual science we're talking about, obviously, because I believe that we don't have the ability to travel forward in time. I don't think that's possible yet. <laughs> so it's not actual science, but it was it was how you imagine the science would be that it just completely baffled me and I had to reread a few parts because I was a little confused. But I did feel very transported into the story, which was, you know, slightly terrifying. But I couldn't pick, stop picturing myself in the scenes, especially because I liked so many of the characters. A large part of the novel takes place in Cornerstone, like I said, which is a large circular jungle, pretty much, that's enclosed by Texas and the sea. 
And inside Cornerstone, 10 years pass for every three minutes on the outside. So what Rawls did, he ran... He, so they run the cycle at 3 p.m. for maximum light, I guess, because your sun above isn't changing its position, but inside 10 years are passing, so you could have 10 years of complete darkness or complete light. I guess they decided that 3 p.m. was the best time for that. And they ran it for eight months at one point, just continuous, and millions of years have passed, allowing millions of years of, of evolution to take place. And so the once familiar ecosystem morphed into a dangerous, unfamiliar, and undiscovered biosphere. The characters talks a lot about how navigating Cornerstone is such a challenge and the characters must endure it, especially because they are expected to live in there and figure out the issues with Cornerstone since they're these geniuses. You know, you have Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein's biological copies. They're expected to do all this. And one of the quotes, one of the main science theories in this novel that is very important that the kids will try to figure out, it's either Isaac or Zach that say this. I know it's some version of Isaac Newton. The character says, it's called the twin paradox. If one twin left Earth on a spaceship at the speed of light, time would pass slower for him dilating to accommodate the speed, and then eventually, when he returned, his brother would be much older or dead. Here, this is backward. Time passes faster. So that thought is basically what evolves over the course of the story as the kids try to figure out what is corner Cornerstone and how can we fix the multiple issues in Cornerstone. A lot goes on in this novel. It's pretty fast-paced, and the frequent changes in point of view allowed for that as well. It was kind of hard for me to keep track of what happened. <laughs> there was a lot, like I said. So, quick overview without spoilers. Alistair and his friends are sent to Cornerstone by Rawls after graduating and finding out that they are these biological copies of historical figures. They don't know what's there. I'm pretty sure Rawls lies to them, like he does a lot. <laughs> and then once Jimmy's workplace and oil rig sinks, he sees some creatures from Cornerstone, the glowy turtles and sharks and stuff he sees underwater. And he barely survives, and he's the only one who survived. He's kind of blamed for the oil rig sinking. He goes and he talks to his father, who is just adorable. Uh, and his father is this huge conspiracy theorist and believes him and I believe has sold some of the shells of the turtles or something. They go to this conspiracy convention, I guess. And Paul from the Pentagon is told to hire Jimmy and his father to work at Corn Cornerstone. They don't know that, you know, time passes differently there, so they're not expecting to go there. I think the deal was to work there for a year or whatever. But the thing is, is, like, you got there and you're there for a year, but then nine more years pass, so you're working for them for ten years when you've really only been there three days, maybe. That's not math. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> it would be, I mean, if they run it for an hour. I'm not even going to try to figure out the math. But while these kids are there, other countries also want this technology, you know? It's this huge race to be able to keep up with the Americans in Cornerstone because, you know, with 10 years passing in three minutes, that's a lot of time passing. They can grow an entire forest in three minutes or a little bit more, I guess. I don't know how long it takes to grow trees. Jeez. But this conflict causes the kids to become trapped in Cornerstone and... I don't know about you, but I don't really want to be trapped in this evolved jungle with glow sharks and a river of ants and 
a cannibalistic human, I say with air crow tribe, because it's unclear whether they're actually human or whether they're evolved humans. And, you know, there's many other creatures. There's, like, I think everything got huge. You have all these ants that are huge, and then you have all these animals that are huge. There's, like, a giant chicken, I think, at one point. So, I mean, which I'm not complaining. A giant chicken kind of sounds awesome, but that's besides the point. (laughs) There was so much that went on with this novel. There's really a lot. Besides that, Milk and, um, Milk and, what's the kid's name? Uh, Alistair. (laughs) They kind of have this relationship, and Leo's adorable, and, um, all these kids just kind of try and navigate this world that they've been just thrown into without warning. They didn't know what they were getting into. So, obviously, they didn't object. They didn't know where else to go. They're young, impressionable kids. And they didn't understand that this isn't some vacation. You can't really get out of it. So, they couldn't really leave, and that's kind of not good. So... (laughs) This novel just had the perfect mixture of adventure, science, horror, friendship, and discovery. I mean, I literally cannot wait for its sequel. I want to know so much more about this world that Charles Wachter has created and brought to life. It's so creative and unique. The characters are amazing. I mean, everything's just perfectly done. The world building is amazing. I mean, you... It's... I believe it takes place during modern times. It's not, I don't think this novel takes place in 2024, you know, sometime in the future, but there's definitely futuristic elements to it, especially with being able to travel through time and you have this pretty much version of Jurassic Park where you have all these creatures that are You'd think we're prehistoric because we don't really see them, but they're really from the future. So it was really interesting to read. It was pretty sciencey. So if you don't really like that much fictional science, maybe this novel isn't for you, but I do encourage you to read it. And that is the end of my review of The Twin Paradox by Charles Wachter. The sequel comes out January 31st, 2022, and thank you again to Travany Bay and Nick Alley for providing me with an arc of this novel for a a review. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please check out my blog, Maya's Reviews, at mayagreviews.wordpress.com, and my name is spelled M-A-Y-A. I also recently started a Twitter account, so you can find me there at Maya the Bookworm. Similarly, you can find me on Goodreads, TikTok, BookBub, and Book Sirens under the same app. I'm also on Tumblr at My Reviews. If you want me to review your book or even just reach out to me, you can email me at mayagbookreviews at gmail.com. I do ask that you, if you are reaching out in regards to a review request or anything of the sort, that you check out my review policy on my blog first, then email me. That way, you can send me the correct criteria and I can get correct formats of novels. Thank you for listening and happy reading!